So, um, hello to all the first attendees to the first Cloud Foundry virtual meetup. Um, so, you will probably notice that you are not in a position to speak. I mean, you're in a position to speak, but we won't be <laughs> to hear you right now. So, this webinar works in a way that um, we can unmute your line in case there are any questions. Um, for now, I would, um, I would start it in a way to have it all, uh, all attendees muted. And if there are any questions, feel free to use the, um, the chat window in, in Zoom or put some comments into the, um, on, on the YouTube page. And we'll just probably wait until the top of the hour before Ben can start. Sounds good. Hello, Matthias. Hey. I joined from the other computer. Oh, it works now. I think so, yes. Yes, we can hear you all fine. Um, if you want to try, you can do like a quick screen share whatsoever to see if that is all good. Okay, let's do this. Yes. Can you see this? I can see the kubectf GitHub page. Okay, that's good. Excellent. So we're, and I see your terminal now. That's the, that's the most important part, the dark <laughs> terminal that everybody loves, I guess. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so oh. that, that looks very promising. I mean, um, what could we do until, <clears throat> until the top of the hour? So, did I? take the screen sharing away again. So now people should see the Cloud Foundry web page. I mean, a couple of things I can do real quick uh, until people start um, joining the, the meetup. A couple of things I would like to say or announce. I mean, as most of you might know, there is the um, Cloud Foundry Summit just around the corner. It's in about two weeks from now. Um, and as a special gift to all the meetup attendees, um, I'm going to give out a discount for 30% on, on, uh, for registering for that summit. I think it's fairly cheap anyway. So 30% is hopefully going to make it almost free. <laughs> and, um, I'm also going to put this one into the, um, into the, uh, chat window or edit to the, to the meetup page. Um, other than that, what else would we be able to show? Um, some things that have changed in Cloud Foundry, especially on if you want to try a Cloud Foundry thing. Um, if you go onto the, to the main web page, um, you can basically find tutorials there. There's a new tutorials page um, with very good description about what Cloud Foundry is and how Cloud Foundry works in, in combination with Kubernetes. We're going to learn a lot more about that today um, in, in both of the sessions. Uh, one very new feature is um, an, a web-based tutorial option on, on Katakoda, for those who don't know that yet. So if you just want to play a little bit with Cloud Foundry, um, you can log in there. This is all for free and you're going to get your own Cloud Foundry Playground in a, in a matter of seconds, hopefully. Um, um, and as far as I know, I heard, this is also based on the kubectf technology, which Tulio and Troy are going to show us later. So here you get, have your Cloud Foundry session. You can start pushing codes, playing around, and, um, and get familiar with the platform. So this is probably the, the easiest and, and fastest way to access it um, without retro string for any free trial or, or whatsoever. Another thing I would like to bring to your attention is there are, uh, with the um, 
Cloud Foundry, there are always these Cloud Foundry awards where everybody can participate and nominate people for categories like contributor, advocate, and user. So um, if, you, if you're using the technology and think um, some people's work should be recognized, this is a great place to do. Um, I guess our speakers for today are some great candidates um, to, to be submitted there. That's probably what I'm gonna do. Um, or if you have any other people like working in, in projects using the technology and you think that should be highlighted, just fill it out and um, everybody's gonna, gonna be happy then. Right, so I'm gonna go on mute, I think, for five minutes or so, and um, then we're gonna, we're gonna kick off the show. So it's me again, a few more people are joining. Um, I can actually see today the majority seems to be over on the YouTube channel. Um, we have about 23 people here, something around 15 in, um, in, the, in, the, in the Zoom webinar. Um, ah, it's getting more. Um, just uh, as a repetition from before, we were using that Zoom webinar technology first time today that enables us to, to stream it live. Um, and <clears throat> we have, there's a Q&A section that you might be able to see and the chat section. In that chat section, I, for example, just added that code for um, Cloud Foundry Summit registration. Um, I will try to scan like Q&A chat and also the comments on the, on the YouTube screen. If you have any questions throughout the talk, 
Um, and then if I think this is like something that should be answered straight away, I'll try to interrupt the, the speakers and um, see if we can get that answered. In case if there's still some things unclear, we can also unmute individual lines um, to get things clarified. I mean, I really want to have this um, as interactive as possible. This is something we won't be able to do through YouTube, however. I mean, if you are on the YouTube channel right now and you want to ask something uh, specific, um, then you should log on to the Zoom webinar. Yeah, Ben, you, you, your background really makes me want to go to vacation soon again. Um, this is kind of a hard, hard thing to see with all that lockdown thing that we have going on. Um, but it, Indeed, we... like it's, it's even worse for me. For the last 10 years, I've done a bicycle race called the Maratona de las Dolomites. It's uh, 10,000 amateur cyclists all ride around the Dolomites one day. And oh. this will be the first time I've missed it. This would have been my 11th consecutive year and not going is very, very strange to me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do that. I would probably just be one of the spectators. <laughs> but <it's> still, still <laughs> very impressive. All right, I just noticed, I just sent my last chat message only to the panelists, not the attendees. Um, if you can have a look at the chat. So this is where I just put it, that uh, work nomination, the, the code for the summit. And I'm also gonna post that link um, about the virtual summit directly. So, um, All right, so feel free to ask us anything you feel like throughout the session. Um, I can see we're close to like 50 people. If, if it's not the same people being logged on, on Zoom and on YouTube. Um, and yeah, we're close to the top of the hour. So Ben, do you wanna take it over from here? And yeah, absolutely. Start the, the sharing. Yeah, here we go. Minimize that real quick. And we're off. Awesome. So uh, thank you, everybody, um, for joining today. And thank you, Matthias, for inviting me uh, to speak here. Uh, my name's Ben Hale. Um, I've been a member of the core spring team since 2000, early 2006 or so. Uh, I've been a member of the Cloud Foundry uh, team since early 2000. 13, I think, probably at this point. Um, over the years, I've had a bunch of different responsibilities. Uh, these days, I'm the Java language lead for Cloud Foundry. Uh, I'm also the Java language lead, where I was originally the Java language lead for Pivotal, and I'm now the Java language lead for the um, uh, VMware modern application platform business unit. But if you're on this call and you're a Cloud Foundry user, most likely uh, you know my name, if you've heard it before, as the lead of the Java Build Pack. And so I'm here to talk to you today about, you know, sort of the, the future of Build Packs, what it means to take an application to an image uh, and, and a couple of different technologies that I've been working on uh, with many other people, obviously, for the last year or two. So, uh, 
let's talk about first uh, the idea of modern application distribution. Um, in the old days, and I am definitely an old guy having worked uh, in enterprise Java for more than 15 years now, uh, we always sort of thought of the artifact that we as developers were creating was a jar file, it was an application artifact. But as we've started seeing languages such as Node.js or Ruby in the old days, even Golang today, um, uh, proliferate even the frameworks inside of Java, whether or not you're dealing with something like Spring, or you're dealing with J2EE, or you're dealing with something like Rat Pack, you know, based in Groovy, uh, Grails as well. We found that it actually becomes harder and harder for entire enterprises to treat application artifacts as the immutable artifacts passing through their systems, right? It was the old days where you'd build a jar file, you'd build a war file, and you'd throw it over the wall to, you know, some ops team who was responsible for hosting a, a Tomcat or a WebSphere and making sure that your jar ran on it. Compounding this is, um, other than basically jar and, uh, sorry, Java and Go these days, many of the common languages that we see people using are actually interpreted rather than compiled, which means that there isn't even really an application artifact. We're distributing source repositories or collections of source code that are going to be run in an interpreted manner rather than some sort of jar file or a compiled binary in Go's case. We're also seeing um, a pretty significant change in the demands from developers themselves. One of the key things is that developers really want to be able to both test their applications in the environment that they'll run in, right? They, they don't want what we, we saw a lot in the old days where it works on my machine when I'm running against Tomcat with my particular configuration for my laptop. But when I throw it over the wall to the ops team, they run it you know, inside of WebSphere on a Solaris machine or something like that. And so the environment can be very, very different. We want to test those. But we also want to control that environment. It is no longer dictated to developers. Here is the environment your application will run in. Rather, what we want is the ability to say, here is the, app, here is the environment that I have decided as a developer, this application should run in, you should run it that way. And so that puts us in a position then where we can make this statement. Docker images have become the lingua franca for platform portability. Uh, this idea that a Docker image behaves as the artifact that I want to move from my laptop, from my CI system into, you know, a QA system and then eventually into production uh, becomes more and more real every day. Maybe not in your particular enterprise, but as a sort of industry-wide whole, it, uh, it, it solves a problem for us because it becomes the immutable artifact and that means it contains the operating system file system, right? If you want to run on Alpine versus running on Ubuntu, running on CentOS, running on SUSE, something like that, you as the developer have control of that because it's contained inside of it. The application file system, if you have a JAR or a WAR or you're a Go developer with a binary or you're a Node developer with Node.js, that is all in there. And then possibly the most important thing for most people, we also have, you also uh, include the command you want to start the application, right? There's never any question about whether or not you've got the proper flags on your command line. And so what this gives us is that desirable feature, an applica uh, sorry, a self-contained environment for running our particular application. And we can depend to some, to most extent, I would say, it's not you know strictly true, that it's going to run the exact same everywhere. If I build an image and don't change it, it runs the same on my laptop, it runs in a data center, it runs in the public cloud, we can switch it between running locally on a Docker daemon, running it on Kubernetes. Uh, in theory, we could run it on Cloud Foundry even before the change to Kubernetes um, using Diego's ability to run Docker images. So it gives us this really, really great bit of consistency. So when it comes to, to building Docker images, today the most common way to build a Docker image is to uh, use a Docker file to do it. And Docker files have a lot going for them. Their flexibility is absolutely their power. You can run any command, you can mutate any file, basically anything you want to do to, to handle those three things that were described before, right? The operating system file system, the application, uh, file system and the commute uh, and the command that's going to run um, is available to you with a Docker file. However, in a lot of ways, that same flexibility for all of the power it brings you 
is also a weakness that they have. We talk a lot about day two weaknesses for Docker files. How do you guarantee that across your entire enterprise, you're keeping your Docker files and the best practices that they encode consistent? How do you ensure that they're being kept up to date? And for example, trying to have a good Docker file turns out to be really, really problematic. And so one example I have is, um, <laughs> even though I'm here to talk to you about um, uh, build packs. Uh, I also have to maintain a bunch of Docker files for various other bits of Pivotal and VMware. And so uh, a quick example of what do we consider to sort of be the best practice for just putting a JRE on an image, right? Something that, that you should be able to have an operating system, put a JRE on it, use that as sort of the upstream base image for something else that we're going to build down downstream. The fact that there is, you know, 30 lines of code here, that there are 10 different arguments. There are two, it's a multi-stage build, right? So like we create one image that does all of the downloading that has a CA certificates and curl and stuff in it, but we don't want those things to actually percolate into the net, into the image that we, we distribute to other people. Like all of this is some, for some something as simple as downloading and validating a checksum. And that gets really, really problematic because uh, if you take a look at some of the stuff that like the, the boot team um, had originally described as here is the best way to run a boot application, we start telling you that what you actually want to do is take a Docker file as hundreds of lines, as many, many stages of builds uh, uh, of, of Docker file or Docker images inside of it, just so that you can get something that's a minimal operating system with a JRE and your application with a command on it. And that, that's really, really problematic um, as you scale from a single developer to a small team, to a team inside of you know, a business, a line of business, to an entire enterprise in one of the, the big verticals like finance or automotive or insurance or something like that, where uh, liability becomes really, really, um, uh, really, really a big thing. So the good news is there's some prior art for how you might want to deal with uh, uh, the, the problems, the day two problems we see with Docker files. And those are build packs. And so in 2011, Heroku invented, and then when we came along Cloud Foundry in 2003, or sorry, 2013, we mainstreamed build packs, right? Build packs aim to raise the value line. They're effectively a trade-off that says, if you're willing to sort of go into a slightly smaller box than you can do anything, we can do a bunch of things for you. We can add value there, allowing you, the developer, to focus on application rather than you, the developer, needing to understand exactly how operating systems work, making sure that your pipelines are designed so that you watch, you know, sort of the upstream uh, operating system image, plus any changes to the, the packages that you've chosen to install. If we, if we go back and we sort of think about this, if you were to write a pipeline that wants to update this, it's not sufficient for you to simply watch upstream Ubuntu Bionic. You'd also need to watch uh, upstream JRE, which is pretty obvious, but you'd also need to watch the upstream CA certificates package when it changes uh, from canonical, the same thing with curl, right? So like all of a sudden, as you start installing more and more of these operating system packages, as you start, you know, curling to download things, right? Some utility that isn't in a package that you want to install, you now end up with really, really complex systems to try and keep this stuff up to date. So build pack aims to raise that value line, right? And we are roughly doing the same kinds of things. Build packs have always created a mutable artifact. We call it a droplet in Cloud Foundry. It was called a slug over on the Heroku side that contains that same application file system that contains the command to start the application. But what it doesn't actually contain is an operating system file system. And this is going to um, end up being important. We'll sort of see it all the way at the, the very end of, um, of this particular presentation. So that meant that a couple of years ago, man, it might almost be three years ago, maybe it's two years ago, it, the time flies. Uh, after um, sort of an after party, after spring one, one year, uh, the Heroku build pack folks reached out to me and the, the build packs team over at Cloud Foundry and said, hey, you guys like it, we like it. We like build packs, but what we're all actually starting to find is that both of us are really liking what we're seeing coming out of Docker. Their slug model, our droplet model, wasn't going to be the lingua franca going forward. We saw these Docker images being uh, an important thing. So if we love this, this, if we, the two companies, love Docker, what should we do? And that's how we came out with 
the cloud native build packs project, which you can start. Um, our website is buildpacks.io. It's got a great resource for linking to everything else that happens uh, with build packs. And so the point of cloud native build packs is that we want to bring the advantages of build packs to the Docker image world because fundamentally we are all in alignment that Docker images are really, really good, especially Docker image v2, the OCI image specification, really, really great. While we don't think that Docker files necessarily fit the, the, the vast majority of use cases for application developers trying to deploy on uh, uh, Docker compatible platforms. That is not to say Docker files aren't the correct answer ever. We're not here to replace Docker files completely. There are certain things where that trade off that build packs aim to, to make that you can go into a slightly smaller box and will give you, you know, more value than we take in front of you isn't actually going to hold. There are many, many examples of stuff that is just so common that is so esoteric that is so, you know, sort of an edge case that a Docker file is the only way that you could package it. But for your sort of common, you know, we sort of call it the fat middle of development, people who are developing just normal Spring Boot applications, people who are developing normal Go or Node applications, it's quite likely that your application fits into a, a rough template that we can do good work for you. And while we're doing that, we want to enable faster builds, not just faster than the builds you used to see in Cloud Foundry, but faster builds and actually doing it with Docker files themselves. We want to encourage reusability of layers, the ability for us to say, hey, this layer needs to um, uh, be reused, not, not just across multiple versions of my application, right? Like I don't want to be downloading the same JRE over and over again, but I actually want it to be reusable across applications. So that's to say, if I'm in an enterprise and I know that the vast majority of our applications are on JRE 1.8.0 underscore 252, there should only be a single layer that represents that, right? It's going to be in our registry. It'll likely already be waiting out on the edge nodes um, for Kubernetes or something like that so that we're not transferring nearly as much data around. We're reusing something that was built once. We want reproducible images, and this is sort of one of the mechanisms that we use to, uh, to, to get reusable layers. This idea that when I untar a JRE using a Docker file, by default, it just gets sort of a timestamp, which is part of identifying a particular layer that's now, whatever now actually is. And if you're really sophisticated, you can go back behind the scenes and do what we actually do automatically, which is, you know, shamod everything to the same user, uh, or sorry, chone everything to the same user, shamod everything to uh, the same permissions, and most importantly, reset the, the uh, file times on everything to one second past 90 1980, so one second beyond the, the Windows Epic, for example, right? And like nobody does this, which means any Docker file that downloads a JRE and untars it, even though the files are exactly the same because they just untarred from the same original tarball, they can't be reused even across multiple builds of a particular Docker file. We also wanted to make some improvements um, on the previous model of build packs inside of Cloud Foundry and Heroku by enabling modularity and composability, and finally, recognition of Docker images being um, uh, the lingua franca of the modern uh, distributed uh, application distribution. We want it to be compatible with the OCI standard. So we're going to jump into a demo now uh, with the PAX CLI. Uh, before I go and do that, uh, any questions, Matthias? At the moment, I think there, there was one. Give me a second. Um, okay. I think it has already been answered. Um, but it was cool. from Enrique. It, if Paketo already supports static files. And <laughs> I saw he actually asked that this morning in the Slack channel. Uh, <laughs> I would hope somebody would have gotten back to it. We'll talk about Paketo in a little bit. Um, uh, but let's first talk about cloud native build packs. Okay. So cloud native build packs, uh, let's take a look at what exactly this means. So um, I'm going to basically be using a sample application uh, that's just a standard Spring Boot application. Uh, if we took a look at it, we would see um, find applications jar. Uh, oh, no, sorry, jar source is a better place to look. Um, so normal source code, it just has a single demo application. If we looked at the palm there, it would just have an actuator. This is basically as close to hello world as I can get. Uh, I've pre-compiled it um, to save some time and effectively I'm, uh, a lot of these tests will just have an exploded uh, jar file as their input. We'll see um, some other examples of things you can do. 
So if I do a pack build applications jar, my uh, autocomplete's going to give away um, a bunch of my uh, future commands, unfortunately, but let's just go ahead and do this. So pack is a CLI. Um, it's created as part of the buildpacks.io, the cloud native build packs project. Uh, it says, I want you to create a particular image for me. This image is going to be called application star. You could just as easily have put in a fully qualified um, domain name for a registry if you wanted to. I'm going to point it at a particular thing. In this case, it is that um, exploded jar file uh, was already pre-compiled and trust builder is a thing we're very, very careful about who we actually expose certain kinds of publication credentials to so that you don't you know, um, expose them to build packs you don't trust and things like that. But I built all of this stuff this morning. Uh, I trust everything that's in here. So let's take a look at what exactly is, is happening here. So uh, building my application here, I'm trying to think of, yeah, okay, this will this will be good enough. Um, so uh, building my particular application here, a bunch of build packs go and participate, right? And the very first one we see, uh, we see detection happen. And detection basically is a, a phase where we go through and we say, okay, here is an application given quite a lot of build packs. In this particular case, there are 15 build packs that could particularly or could potentially participate. It could be significantly larger than that. Um, we, we distribute internally things with 40 or 50 build packs on them. Which one of you actually want to participate? Very analogous to the detect phase of build packs previously. Uh, the first one that chose to uh, participate is the Paquetto build staff, build, sorry, Bellsoft Liberica build pack. Bellsoft Liberica is just a JRE distribution. It talks about some of the things, some of the environment variables you can set in order to configure it. And we're off to the races. It does a bunch of stuff, right? Uh, we'll look a little bit deeper into what exactly it does, but it goes off and it contributes a bunch of layers. So what we expect here is we've already got a downloaded JRE, but it goes off and expands a JRE, but does a bunch of other stuff. The executable jar build pack kicks in a little bit later and it goes off and it sets a command line that's actually going to run. This is sort of a traditional Spring Boot command line. And then there's a Spring Boot one that does some Spring Boot specific stuff. And we'll talk about exactly what's going on um, a little bit later when we talk about Paquetto. But I do actually want to, to show sort of um, what, what sort of might happen here, right? Uh, one of the key things is we've basically gone from a pre-compiled jar file to an image in less than 20 seconds. And that includes from scratch. There was nothing waiting around for us other than the fact that the jar was actually pre-compiled. If we run that exact same command again, what we should actually end up seeing is quite a lot of avoidance now, and especially in the middle bit. This is sort of, you know, there's there's some overhead and infrastructure for sort of uh, bringing up a Docker container to do the work in. You can see the build though, like the bits here where we decided to actually contribute the JRE or, or anything else happened almost instantly because we can identify that the JRE that we would have contributed to the image actually already is in the image, wherever that is, whether it's on a registry or in the Docker daemon. We do this really cute thing where um, we compare a small bit of metadata to find out if we were going to do if we were going to contribute the same thing and if we do the build pack can do avoidance we go off here things have already chopped uh what's that about 40 percent here uh things the, the improvement is actually significantly better if i wasn't streaming zoom uh right now uh my five-year-old laptop is really creaking under uh the strain of trying to keep a giant docker uh, demon running along with everything else that happens here but what we're looking at here is we get all of this avoidance no work actually happens here other than some kind of comparison but the docker image that gets created uh, is um, a, more or less exactly the same. We can we can sort of demonstrate this idea that you know even avoidance where we see like 100% avoidance here isn't the the hard requirement. We can do selective avoidance as well with with the the cloud native build packs. So um, one of the configuration changes I'll make for this particular application is we're going to um, build it with Java 8 this time instead. So this is going to cause the build pack to make slightly different decisions when it comes time to figuring out exactly which layers we're going to are going to, to be reused. So this time we see that we're contributing 80252 instead of previously we contributed 1107 uh, latest versions, but only for unzipping the JRE and not for some of the things that are the same regardless of the version of the JRE, the way security providers and certificate um, 
stuff works is actually different between eight and post nine, uh, eight and nine um, uh, versions of the Jerry. So those actually have to be recontributed. But the stuff that's the same, things like the memory calculator, link local DNS, we'll talk a little bit later, didn't have to be reused uh, as we go. So uh, that's one of the things that we can see, right? Now, what exactly does the image that we're creating look like, right? Like that's the next question. Everybody likes a, a nice clean image. So I'm gonna use a command called dive. If you haven't used this before, uh, it is one of the revelations of the last sort of year of my career. I think at this point, I actually spend more time in dive than I do in uh, uh, any of the other tools that I use, including my IDE. And this is just a way for us to go through and look at how uh, an image is created layer by layer, how it's assembled layer by layer. Because remember, effectively a way a Docker image works um, in, in the, the, the V2 or the OCI image specification, those two are equivalent to one another, is there are a set of layers which describe a file system. And then there's a manifest that's a bunch of, it's an ordered list of pointers to those particular things. Right, so we start with uh, an operating system image here. Uh, this happens to be Ubuntu Bionic, whatever the, the latest version of that is, um, and it's about 63 megs. And we add some stuff to it uh, around Docker and things like that. Uh, and eventually we get to this thing where we start adding a couple of bits of cloud native build pack stuff, this lifecycle launcher. But then, right, Right at that point, the operating system, plus what do I see there, another five megs or so, uh, no, sorry, another 10 megs or so, we start adding layers from the build system, uh, or sorry, from the, the, the build pack itself. So we see that the Bellsoft Liberica added a class counter thing, who knows what that is, something about configuring Java security properties, and eventually contributes a JRE. The key thing to notice about this internally is that the JR, that each one of these layers, it's in this layers directory with a unique identifier, they're disjoint with one another. One of the reasons that Docker files specifically require you to, anytime you change sort of a higher layer, you have to rebuild all of the lower layers, is that any lower layer can modify a higher layer. But the cloud native build pack specification, again, if you're willing to go into a smaller box, we can do things for you. One of the things the specification describes, excuse me, is that you cannot overwrite layers that already exist. There is a sandbox for you to do what you want, but you are limited to that particular sandbox, right? And so we've got a JRE here. We see some other stuff around JVM kill, uh, things there. Eventually we get down to here is our application, but even an application, isn't on a completely separate layer. Um, Jib showed us, you know, some interesting ways where dividing layers up might potentially um, help data transfer speeds and uh, deduping and things like that. So we got one that has all of our libraries on it, one that has our application on it. If we had snapshots, they'd be in there and some other stuff. And eventually we get out to exactly what the command that's going to be run is. So this is what sort of the file system looks like inside. But that pack CLI uh, will also tell us things about uh, inspect image will tell us things about the created uh, image as well. So for example, it will tell us that we were using a particular stack. Uh, so this is sort of the idea of the base image. Um, it happens to be bionic based on what it's called. Uh, it'll tell us where the, the top layer is. This will come in handy a little bit later. Um, so that we can we can talk about what it means to uh, when operating systems uh, have vulnerabilities on them. It'll tell us all the build packs and their versions, you know, that that actually um, participated in here. And then it even tells us about the different commands that might be run. And in this particular case, they're all exactly the same. One single build pack, you know, sort of created the the uh, the command that was going to run it. But there is a very real possibility that as you start combining applications together, as you start having multiple um, uh, collaborating build packs or multiple languages inside of your application, you end up with different process types as well. There's even a proc file build pack that knows how to turn all of the entries inside of a proc file into um, process types as well. And so we can uh, actually run this. So uh, we'll say t dash p uh, applications jar source. By default, if I don't specify anything, it's going to run the web process type as it says there. I could just as easily uh, specify one of these by name. I can even run a specific command. So let's go ahead and fire one of these up. Oh, not jar, jar source. 
Here we go. We see it goes off and does some things. One of the really, really interesting uh, side effects of using cloud native build packs here is that uh, you can actually go into them, right? Uh, there happens to be a shell in this particular image. And it means that uh, we've moved a lot of the resolution of things to basically profile D scripts, right? Uh, trying to find out how much memory is going to go in there, um, doing things like adding containers to the JVM trust store. And that means you can, if you ever wanted to know what exactly was going to happen or what environment your application was going to run in, you can simply log into it and find out what the environment is, right? We know what the Java home is going to be. We know how Java security properties, like where that file is gonna be configured, what exactly the path will look like if you're using sort of a non-Java thing. All of this stuff ends up inside of the environment that your command will eventually be run in as part of um, a shell. One final uh, feature that I want to discuss here is pack inspect image. And there is what we call a bill of materials. Um, it happens to be a label on the created image. It has uh, adjacent payloads. I'm going to pipe it through JQ here. And this gives us a lot of information. Build packs opt to contribute to this, but we can put a lot of information in there. So for example, if we take a look at this, uh, we can see, for example, that a JRE was contributed. It happened to be Bellsoft. It uh, can be downloaded at this location if you want to know where it was from. Your security and compliance departments really, really would like to know what the license for this particular dependency is. But most importantly, I think for you, exactly which version it came to. And so all of these different um, dependencies that were contributed, right, they're all uh, sort of give this kind of information. So we now have an inventory beyond someone vets what the base image is, what the operating system is. We can then take a look at the metadata without having to download the image, right? Like we know the image is going to be um, uh, 100, 150 megs, something like that. We don't want to download all that data. Instead, we can just download this particular metadata, something very small. And given that particular metadata, we can find out what dependencies the build pack contributed, but we can go even further than that. Because we have access to the application, we can find the application dependencies as well. Do you have one of the many, many uh, vulnerable versions of Jackson, right? Do you have a version of Spring Boot that has some sort of vulnerability in it? All of these things now are attached to the outside of the image because the cloud native build pack specification has this idea of a bill of materials. Before we jump out of this particular demo and back to some slides, Matthias, any questions? There are some questions, but um, I think okay. some, something which you will cover also later. I mean, one of the questions okay. was, are these Valerian Alps in your background? I can answer this now. These are the Italian <laughs> Dolomites and not the Valerian Alps. Um, <laughs> And then Aaron had a question, will the CF cloud controller leverage KPEG internally as part of CF push? I think this is something you want to talk later about, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit later uh, about it sort of um, just as a voiceover. The answer to jump all the way to the end is yes, uh, KPAC is likely to be the internal component that brings these kinds of build packs, uh, cloud native build packs to Cloud Foundry itself. Yeah. And then another one, how would I add my own root CAs during the build pack process? Uh, how do I add my own root CAs? Uh, so unfortunately, um, this is something we have not quite addressed yet. Uh, there is an RFC open in the Cloud Native Build Pack specification to deal with this specific problem. Um, I complained in one of our Slack channels that I believe this is the highest priority problem we currently have. Now that we're building lots of build packs, we're seeing adoption. It is something that I am acutely aware of. People. Um, who use Java are sort of disproportionately inside of enterprises with, you know, a very large number of self-signed CAs or a very, you know, an internal corporate CA that doesn't tie back to any sort of global CA. I totally get this. Um, there are a couple of different ways to do it. It's effectively being handled at a platform level today. So like KPAC has very specific support. It's not part of the cloud native build pack standard. Um, Heroku does it in a slightly different way. Google does it in a third way. We know that the specification needs to have a way to do this today. Um, and the uh, both the pack team is taking a look at it for this particular implementation as well as the spec um, team doing it as well. There are some pretty 
awful workarounds where you basically take our builder image and you add a certificate using a Docker file, which is exactly as ironic as you think it is, uh, that we have to use a Docker file to do something so that you don't have to use Docker files. It is possible today, um, but we are like full speed ahead. This has to be a problem that we're going to solve. All right, cool. Thanks very much. No worries. So let's jump back into some slides. Uh, so one of the really interesting things about cloud native build packs is that it's a specification without an implementation. There are no build packs in this thing. We specifically set up the CNCF project as a place where companies can collaborate on how we would interop with one another, how one person can write a build pack and that build pack can run on Heroku and it can run on Cloud Foundry and it can run on Google and it can run on Microsoft and it can run on, uh, you know, half a dozen other platforms that uh, I uh, unfortunately forget their names that they are as valuable as any of the others to us. Um, I really should be better about that, but not on the implementations themselves. And the key reason for this is that participants of this particular project, right? They see the need for source to image capability. Fundamentally, this is a thing we need. We need to be able to get from Java files or Golang files or Node.js files into an image to run in a, you know, in a um, different environment. But our sort of core markets are remarkably divergent from one another. And this has actually worked out really, really powerfully for us because Heroku comes from a world where there's a, you know, SaaS, right? They've always built even Java from source in a way Cloud Foundry has. And, but it does mean that when they take a look at build packs, they see, oh, being always online and being able to download any dependency I want to, that's really, really, you know, that's sort of standard operating procedure for us. We want something that allows us to do that. Our build packs are going to make those assumptions. Cloud Foundry, on the other hand, we don't really have a SaaS, right? Like we have Pivotal Web Services, obviously, but our primary market is on-prem users that require air-gapped environments. They cannot just go download random build packs. Heroku is big on bring your own build packs. If you take a look at sort of the long tail of the number of build packs, they, they have applications being built with over there. There are hundreds and hundreds of them. Most Cloud Foundry installations will only use sort of the 15 build packs that we ship, maybe a small handful of, of others, but not really. It's certainly not the same kind of ecosystem. Google has, you know, sort of their Googly way of doing things. Microsoft has, you know, the, the concerns they have around, you know, stability over uh, all others. So like each one of the participants has a different goal for the build packs they might build that's different from one another. So it doesn't make sense to keep it within um, uh, the specification project itself. But Cloud Foundry really likes these kinds of build packs. Right? How exactly do we sort of square that circle? And the answer is a project called Picado. Uh, although the, um, <laughs> the pronunciation of this name is somewhat contentious, given that uh, we are all very distributed from one another. We rarely say the word to one another. There are a couple of different pronunciations. I'm sticking with Picado for right now. It's a Greek for package, I believe, um, to go along with sort of the, the Kubernetes Greek naming scheme. And so Picado build packs are a Cloud Foundry Foundation sub-project. They're a re-implementation of all the Cloud Foundry build packs you have, specifically without Cloud Foundry branding. Uh, same teams are still working on it. We're uh, aiming for a complete feature parity between the two different groups. But the key thing is here, um, for better or for worse, there is some baggage associated with Cloud Foundry and the broader Kubernetes ecosystem. I don't think it is deserved at all. I think we've you know, been great stewards. I think today, every time I deal with Kubernetes, every time I, uh, um, have to write, you know, a 500 line YAML file. I think to myself, Cloud Foundry customers are not going to tolerate this. What they want is to be able to say CF push, right? I have an application. I need that application to run. I do not care how, right? They, the old Cloud Foundry um, haiku. So for better, or for worse, there's some baggage in there. So we opted for a rebrand. Fundamentally, though, the point of Potato is to target the same customers we target today, on-prem customers with strict control requirements, things like air-gapped builds, things like auditability, support for sort of the, the core five languages. PGP is clearly wrong. That should be PHP, uh, as, as weird as it sounds. Uh, one of the largest language uh, communities on Cloud Foundry is PHP still. So there's that. Um, uh, so like we're we're aiming to give you what you already have today, but taking advantage of this new kind of specification. So let's go ahead and jump in and take a look at the potato build packs in a little more depth than what we've looked at so far. 
Let's see, uh, potato build packs. So if we take a look at the builder we've been using, inspect builder, Let's see what this comes back as. If we take a look at the builder that we're currently looking at, uh, that I'm using for this particular demo, what I ended up seeing is that we said earlier there were five build packs that participated out of 15. Here are the 15. If you took a look at sort of the, the default one that, that comes with pack that the Potato team creates, there's way more than 15. I think we're up to 30 or 35 on that particular one now. But you'll see that we do all sorts of different kinds of things, right? Like we've got Potato Build Pack for dealing with Tomcat. You give us a war, we know what to do with it. You integrate with Azure Application Insights, we know how to do that for you. Download an agent, configure, you know, based on a service binding, exactly what your um, instrumentation key is going to be. You want to do debugging inside of a container. Yeah, we can help you with that. We can do the auto configuration for Java debugging. We do some other crazy things like if you happen to be using a registry, right, that does not have encrypt, uh, encrypted data at rest. So for example, we've worked a lot with the Azure Spring Cloud team um, and ACR does not have encryption at rest. It's coming, but it's not there. So if you have requirements for your application to be encrypted when it's sitting on a file system, right, we can satisfy that. A build pack can take a look at your application right before it gets ready to go um, uh, to, be, uh, to be stored and we'll go ahead and encrypt data based on a key in a system that you've specified. And then the very first thing, or the very first thing that happens when um, your application starts is we go and we unencrypt all of that, put it back into the file system at exactly the same place and run your application at that particular time. We've got Google and what we're going to see is we actually have some build, build uh, system stuff. So Gradle, Maven, SBT are both available to us. We know how proc files work, Spring Boot, stuff like that. So let's take a look at some of the new things that we can do. Uh, sorry, pack build, applications, jar, source. And for the first time, uh, if you're familiar with Cloud Foundry's build pack, Java build pack specifically, we did not build from source for various reasons, but to support um, the broader Kubernetes ecosystem, especially Knative and Project Rift, the, um, uh, the, the function as a service kind of system, we will build from source. So the very first thing that happens in here, uh, and I'm gonna stall a little bit as uh, something very slow happens later on, uh, is we actually download a JDK in addition to the JRE itself. And this is really important because one of the things we want to do is help you not accidentally bring a JDK into production. Most uh, security teams would consider a JDK in production having a compiler and all of the tools that are available there to be a massive security vulnerability. So the build pack sort of encapsulates the logic that says, hey, JDK should only be available at the time and should never under any circumstances make it into an image at runtime. So we do that. We also do a bunch of other stuff, right? Like, for example, we set Malloc Arena Max, and I assume most of you that are not getting ready to present about SUSE today uh, don't even know what this is. But there's a problem running uh, things like JVMs inside of containers, and one of those things is libc has this idea of Malloc Arenas, that when you ask for a, a piece of memory, it actually pre-provisions certain blocks of memory for you. So while the amount you might be using in your application is small, the fact that you've got a bunch of these kinds of blocks um, uh, all over the place sort of multiplies the number of megs you might have. One of the biggest problems we ever dealt with running inside of Cloud Foundry because the enforcement of your container size includes all of these malloc arenas, regardless of whether your application actually uses the size or uses the memory that's in them. And so we do some work to make sure that you can run your JVM inside of the, the, um, the container. Same thing with active processor count. For various reasons, the JVM does not properly calculate virtual processors and turn them into logical processors. Uh, for a long time, um, we struggled with the fact that uh, JVMs, for some reason on Cloud Foundry, thought they only had a single virtual processor, even though they absolutely had more. So we encapsulate the logic to make sure that the JVM understands how many processors you have in a virtualized environment and can do the parallel things that it needs to do. We go further beyond that. We brought over things like the, the memory calculator from Cloud Foundry. So we know how to take a look at your application, take a look at the JRE that's running and give you the optimal configuration that you can override if you want to, setting your know, normal Java ops environment variables. We do things like link local DNS. Uh, it's a dirty little secret that um, the JVM was invented before, for example, DNS time to live ex uh, came into existence. And for compatibility reasons, it's never changed. The JVM, as soon as it resolves an IP address successfully once, 
unless you configure it otherwise, will hold that forever. So if you're using a very, very dynamic DNS, like in a Kubernetes environment, you don't ever see that certain applications have changed IP address that you're connecting to. So we're very, very careful that we say, hey, if it looks like your DNS is close to you, right? Like if it was on the same Diego uh, cell that you were on, right? Or if it was in your Bosch deployment, or if it's in your Kubernetes cluster, if we can sort of establish that, what we're going to do is we're going to turn off caching completely. The, the call to something that locals quick enough, and it probably means you're in one of these very dynamic DNS environments. So we want to go and do that. And we go sort of on and on from there. We can see, for example, that open SSL certificates, we talk about what it means for um, people to manage uh, their own custom internal CA certs. Well, this is a big, big problem because the JVM predates open SSL and it has its own key store thing. And that key store thing is a giant pain in the ass, um, given that there's a new standard in the world that everybody else uses. So we're gonna do the help and say, hey, all you need to do is get your certificates into the standard location on an operating system. We'll make sure they show up in your JVM once you get beyond that. The next thing we saw was Maven, off to the races, right? Like we've got some default things to build a Maven thing. We support Gradle, we support, support SPT if you're on Scala and things like that. And it's actually gonna build this whole thing from source, right? Goes off, uh, downloads everything. We actually um, uh, uh, save all of those dependencies after the first particular run. And for example, if we wanted to rebuild this, we might, put some sort of file that changes exactly what the application is and we'll do another pack build. And we go off to the races, pull some stuff up. It notices all of these layers. We saw layer reuse before, but we can even do the Maven thing, right? Maven is not going to download everything. It just does one quick build based on the dependencies we had before and we're done. We'll notice Spring Boot does some things about creating slices. If you've followed along the Spring Boot 2.3, um, development uh, system. We saw uh, them add a bunch of Kubernetes friendly things or Docker image friendly things. One of the things is describing how you should slice up an application so that you get the most reuse. We take care of all that. We put a bunch of labels on images, right? The standard OCI labels for title and version based on what came out of your Maven configuration. Uh, one of the things I really quite like is Spring Boot will tell you all of the properties you might ever want to configure inside of your application. We can set that as a label on an image, which means you can start building GUI tools that say, hey, get me the metadata for that image so that I can offer to users. Here are all the properties you might want to set. Do you want to set springdatasource.url? Do you want to set, you know, logging.whatever kind of thing? We can offer those things to you using nothing but metadata um, and plants it on the outside of images. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, the final thing I'll do is just one more Docker run here, jar source, and show you the things that happen, right? We, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Since I didn't set a memory, it sort of assumes one gig, uh, since the default is like nine petabytes or something like that. We calculated a memory configuration that will fit into here. If I set any one of these with, you know, sort of a a dash dash n to set the, a different size. It will recalculate everything. We see that on startup, it adds all of the CA certificates to the trust store, and eventually we end up with a running application. So that's sort of some of the things that the Paquetto build packs do. I would highly recommend going and taking a look at the other Paquetto build packs uh, as we go along. Now, Pack isn't the only tool. It's a great entry point into the cloud native build packs ecosystem, particularly good for local development. But if you're, you know, sort of in a line of business or even a team really where you want sort of hands off um, uh, high volume builds, there are a bunch of different things, uh, different other places where there are implementations beyond Pack. So Azure Spring Cloud is one of those. Google Cloud Run is another one of these. Um, VMware's KPack tool, which was referenced a little bit earlier, which is like a real Kubernetes native um, controller that runs it, watches your source code or, or, or watches a configuration that you, you've set on it. And whenever something changes, we'll go and basically create a stream of images. Every time a new commit happens, a new image comes out. Or every time you make an update to the configuration, a new thing 
thing comes out. Every time you um, change the operating system underneath, we'll automatically rebuild for you. Every time you change a build pack so that a new version of the JRE comes in, we'll create a new image for you. What you choose to do with those images is totally decoupled. It's a bit different from what, the way Cloud Foundry works, but it's uh, a, a component that will be included in Cloud Foundry that says, watch code, turn into image, right? And that's all it does in a really, really automated way. But if we say that there are multiple implementations, multiple platforms that include and, and drive the cloud native build pack specification, there's one that's really near and dear to my heart, and that's Spring Boot. Because as I said in Spring Boot 2.3, Spring Boot is showing its love for Kubernetes, right? That's a really, really big thing. But if you are Spring Boot and you want to describe how to help your users get to Kubernetes, what are your options? As we said, you know, 150 line Docker file that people are just going to copy and paste in Cargo Cult and nobody really likes that. Or we can use Cloud Native Build Packs and Paquetto, right? Uh, there are Maven and Gradle plugins that drive the Cloud Native Build Packs lifecycle and automatically do some things for you, right? In addition to obviously the builds that you'd expect to see, it knows things like the image name and the image tag and the Java version that should actually be specified, right? So let's take a look at that as a demonstration. And if I can remember what I'm supposed to run, uh, we'll go into applications, jar source, and I'll go ahead and run MVN. Uh, in this particular case, it's called spring dash boot build image. I'm trying to think of what the Gradle one is. It's like boot build image or something like that, but it goes off, builds the jar file first thing, Once the jar file and all of its tests have passed, it goes off and builds an image. You'll notice the image name that it's trying to go off and build is going to be, oh, that's gonna be ugly. Apparently somebody did a build of this uh, builder this morning. <laughs> uh, but it's going, it knows that the name of my application was demo. It knows that the name, uh, the version of mine happened to be 001 snapshot. So you actually get something really useful coming out of it they went off and looked at the Maven configuration. So they know that this application is a Java 8 application and sets that for me so that I don't have to do it, right? I don't have to explicitly set this. The default would have been 11. Um, if, my, if I had configured my application to be Java 11, then this you know, wouldn't have been set at all. But it goes off, it does the build exactly as you saw it before, sets the exact same things, and we now have an image called this, right? So we can say Docker, run demo 001 snapshot and we have our running Spring Boot application. So this is another alternative uh, way to build images using the exact same underlying technology, the exact same build packs you'd expect, you know, if the Heroku team or the Google team or somebody built a build pack that you liked better than Paquetto, it would just work uh, with this. So, Everything we've talked about so far focuses on you, the developer, the experiences and outcomes for to help you build software, right? How you get an application into an image and then an image out onto your platform of choice. But there are other concerns, right? Your security team has a really rough job. We all hate them because they stop us from doing things. But on the other hand, they all make sure that you don't get sued out of existence when a bunch of data is lost. So given a zero day like Heartbleed or something, how do you actually ensure that all your apps are safe, right? If you're a Docker file company, man, you hope that the Docker file base image that people were using, and if you don't have a lot of control in your company, that may mean there are hundreds of different base images all get updated really quickly. Maybe you are a better company and there's a single golden base image internally that everybody has to go to. But even then, you're talking about rebuilding all of the applications in your entire system on top of this new base image. So better hope everybody's pipeline is green and your build cluster has a lot of CPU time behind it because you're gonna to have to build everything simultaneously. So this is one of the big things that Cloud Foundry has always done really, really well. We can do this thing where we switch out the root FS, we can switch out the stem cell under running applications, right? We effectively uh, stream your application, a new, um, a new copy of your application's droplet, a new copy of the operating system into another cluster, or sorry, another Diego cell. We start it up, and then once we are sure that's stable, we go shut down all of the other stuff. And reusing that, basically getting instantaneous startup on top of new operating systems is part of that story. And it's part of the story that Docker files specifically can't do, while Docker images do allow. So the cloud-native build packs have functionality called image rebasing. 
an image rebasing basically says, hey, if I know that an OCI image is a manifest that has an ordered point, an ordered set of pointers to a bunch of layers, well, then we can go through, identify which of those layers are the base image and rewrite the manifest. It works exactly like a git rebase does, where we take all of the top layers and we basically move them on to a different set of bottom layers. And it happens incredibly fast, right? This is the, one of the most, the first time I saw this, I thought it had gone wrong because what we actually do is we go to a registry, we download only the image metadata, about 100K, maybe even less than that. I, I particularly really load up the amount of metadata we put into our images. So maybe it's only 10K for a lot of things. We modify it that, that manifest pointed a new base image and upload it back to the registry. And that happens quick like way less than a second. We depend on the same contract we did in Cloud Foundry, this ABI compatibility for safety, right? You must have, you know, something that guarantees not only APIs won't change, but even binary behavior won't change, um, uh, except for bugs being fixed. So let's take a quick look at that as we wind down here. Uh, I'm gonna pull up my cheat sheet. None of you have seen this, I swear. Uh, so that we can run this. This is sort of a canned demo that I do for um, analysts and things like that. So what we're actually going to say is uh, this command, it doesn't matter particularly, but what we're, what we're effectively saying is I want you to take version 0017 and that's going to be the run image for a particular application that I'm going to use. All right. And let's go ahead and build that particular application. We're going to publish it straight to... Uh, 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 we're gonna publish it straight to a registry that I have uh, running locally on this machine. And no, I don't. thought that was gonna happen. Uh, see my end there real quick. Docker start registry. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Uh, give me a second. Development. I was wondering if this was going to survive this morning. always the last most expensive bit of the demo is going to, to break down. Uh, since we have a moment here as it attempts to rebuild all of this for me, uh, does anybody have, are there any outstanding questions that I can answer from the, the Paquetto or Boots stuff? One second, please. Um, I'm here. Okay. So um, there were, I think, two questions from Jonathan Matthews. I'm, I'm not sure if I have to copy that over and if I can read it out loud. Uh, as someone who's built a few small and focused build packs in a multi-BP uh, context, I really value all the low barrier to entry with shell scripts for bin and slash detect compile supply final as question, how screwed am I? <laughs> or what's the build pack <laughs> developer experience like in this new world? Uh, in fact, it's it's even simpler than it used to be. There are only two scripts. There is bin detect and bin build. Uh, so, and they can be in any language that they want. I think actually we also have a requirement for a build pack.toml, which sort of has some metadata about this particular build pack. So on the plus side, it's that. Now, if you tried to go to buildpacks.io and navigate it through to the specification, the specification is huge, right? Like there's a lot of features about uh, things like build plans, so how build packs communicate with one another, how layers work, um, how you communicate environment variables in and out. There's a bunch of different things, but we've attempted to and would love, you know, sort of community feedback on whether we've been successful about this um, to... Uh, um, make it a progressive level of complexity. If all you want is a bash script, then you should be able to write a bash script that doesn't know anything about layers, doesn't know anything about build pack plans, doesn't know anything about environment variables or anything like that. It only has the things that you want to use. And then as you want to make a more uh, complex build pack, you can opt into sort of additional features from there. So we hope it's actually easier this time for you to write a simple shell script based build pack. All right, and then Emily uh, asked 
I think this is directly to you. Um, if you set minus minus network on your commands, um, I, I something tells me this is Emily, one of my coworkers, telling me that I should do something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so let's, let's see if I can get back to this demo real quick. So uh, the run image is version 17. We'll go ahead and build. And it's just not going to happen for me. Okay, uh, clearly, oh, she's telling me that I need to do something with dash dash network, which I don't actually know what it's going to be. What, what else does she say to do? That was the only comment that I could see on. Um, okay. On Let's see if that works. No. Yeah, something has changed uh, underneath me. Uh, so we're not going to get through this. Uh, so uh, rather than continuing to waste time on this, um, as we go forward, uh, eventually we would have run the rebase. It would have been really impressive. It would have taken somewhere around a tenth of a second to actually do that thing. Uh, I apologize for not being able to um, actually execute that right now. So uh, just to close out in the last couple of minutes here, um, the point of cloud native build packs was for us to bring the advantages of build packs to the Docker image world. So we've got faster builds, we've got reusable layers, reproducible images, things like that, right? As part of the specification that's interoperable, uh, hopefully across many, many platforms that adopt this same specification. As we've seen, we already see Microsoft and we already see uh, Google and Heroku and Cloud Foundry and a number of other different platforms already adopting um, this, this build pack specification. Paketo happens to be Cloud Foundry sub-brand for the build packs that you're already familiar with as we translate them onto this new, uh, this new setup. Right, this new specification. And uh, there are a bunch of different ways to actually use cloud native build packs. Pack, obviously, as I um, showed here, K Pack as open source from, from Pivotal originally and VMware now. If you're running on Heroku's Evergreen, Google Cloud Run, Microsoft Azure, Spring Cloud, and even Spring Boot potentially as well. Um, there are a set of references here sitting at the end, uh, and we'll distribute the, the slides. Uh, later on, but thank you. And I guess open it up for any final questions that are going to follow out from here. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks very much. That was a very impressive demo and a lot of stuff in there. So I definitely have to watch that again in, in slow motion. I think this, this is normally what I do if with the Josh Long talks. It's just like slow <laughs> them down and you know that. Um, I don't think there were any additional questions in the in the channel at the moment so what i would suggest to do like a let's say five to ten minutes break um uh, like bio break whatsoever and let people um digest on that and then see um if and any more questions come up um either here in this in the zoom meeting or or on youtube yeah sounds great i'll, I'll hang out here and uh, answer any questions that people um post in thanks again thanks everybody <clears throat> Great stuff, Ben. I loved our demo. Thanks. Let me open up Slack and find out what uh, Emily was screaming at me. <laughs> Ilya, I'll be back in two minutes. Sounds good. Definitely looking forward to have Paketo integrated with KubeCF. Yeah. Especially the part that you said that you 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 make the JVM, you took the JVM to run inside containers. That's definitely something that we want. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing how bad it is. And even that the Open JDK team is like, it, they're doing work, right? Like they recognize this as a way to run JVMs, but some of the stuff that it takes so long to get stuff in that, you know, sort of in Java 9, they added something that was a little bit naive. In Java 11, they added something that was also naive. And like, it doesn't sort of, one, one of the things that we've, we've discovered, you know, um, 
uh, since 2013 running Java on Cloud Foundry is that, uh, you know, there are very clear things, very clear assumptions you can make, such as for a given application at a JRE that doesn't change, everything except heap is completely static, right? Regardless of the size of the container, the amount right. of reserved code cache, the amount of metaspace, that's all constant, right? So when you calculate memory as the container size varies, you want to make sure that you give all of that to heap or take it all away from heap without touching any of the rest of the stuff. Then you look at the JVM's, you know, magic flag for running inside of containers and great it looks at you know sort of the c group definition but then it uses a percentage right and so for a given constant application there's exactly one container size that the percentage is accurate for if you change the container you know if you make the container larger it's under allocating heat you know if you make it smaller right. it's over allocating heat and and like you sort of get the feeling like they know this, but they can't change anything until Java 17, you know, two years from now. So uh, we do what we can to, to, to cross things over until then. It's interesting that you mentioned percentage because uh, recently we had a, we, we hit a, a, you know that phrase that you should not treat your containers there as uh, you treated your VMs? Mm, yeah. Everybody heard about this, right? And then like, if we're doing simple stuff, uh, yeah, you may sometimes just consider, yeah, my container is just my VM. But then when you start to, to think about memory, uh, proc mem info inside your container is actually the proc mem info of your host, which is yeah. in Kubernetes world is your node. And if you say, yeah. I allow you to consume 50% of the memory inside the container, it's actually 50% of the memory of your node, which may yeah. be like 64 gigs, I don't know, right? And, yeah. We have one more question here, and I think that's the sure. uh, one you could probably easily show. I, I'd like to compile my Java classes during the pack process and then not using the Spring Boot plugin. What's the command for that again? Uh, you just do a standard pack build with your uh, pointing at source code. Let me give you a quick share here. Uh, yeah, that'll do. Let's let this finish up. Uh, well, streaming data to some random place. Anyway, let's do it here. So if you do a pack build, give it a name, jar source. The key thing is you need to point to jar source. Um, or that you need to point to a source directory. So if we did a ls in there, we'd say jar source here. Uh, and it's just a source tree. So you don't need to use the, the Maven plugin or anything like that. All uh, jar source test.txt. Go ahead and remove that. And if I do that pack build command again. See so it go off to the races, and it will ask for both a JDK and a JRE. So JDK for build time, and the Maven plugin will get involved. If you had Gradle, the Gradle plugin will do it. If you're a Scala person, the SVT plugin will kick in, and it just runs a command. MVNW if you've got the wrapper. If it doesn't, it just runs MVN. It runs Maven without any of your tests and package. But you may be the kind of person who absolutely wants that. So you can, for example, change that build command to do env, uh, what did I say it was? <laughs> BP maven build arguments equals just package, right? Just something like that. And then it will ru actually run this exact same command with, um, or sorry, run this exact same build, but actually run the tests inside of it as well. Hopefully we'll see tests go by. Never do a demo you've never done before. <laughs> So who knows? There, there we go. So now it's off going and grabbing all the test jars and actually running the tests as part of this particular build. So I hope this answers the question. Um, and this, this user is just like signed in as a name user, so I can't really <laughs> address it there. There's another one from Jonathan. So question is, so if I write a simple supply style build pack, implementing no specific features from Paketo, um, BPIO, do I still get the advantages around caching, reusing, rebasing, metadata, exposure, et cetera? Uh, 
you opt into each one of those things, right? To each one of those features. So if you just did something where you messed with the application, well, the image that's created at the end, you know, sort of you get the rebasing advantages of that because it doesn't really matter. But if you want to take advantage of uh, layer avoidance, it requires you to write to a particular layer rather than the application. It requires you to write a piece of metadata the first time and read that metadata on subsequent things. So you've never been required to do it, but to get the layer avoidance, you, the build pack, opt into layer avoidance by saying, hey, here's some metadata that I want you to hand me back in the future. When you get that back, you can make a decision on whether or not to avoid or not from there. And so each one of these features is, if it's something valuable to you, right? In, in almost all cases, it requires like uh, putting images on labels, right? You need, or adding to the, the bill of materials, you write to a specific location in your build pack to contribute that information or to participate in that particular life cycle. But it's not a take it or leave it all or nothing kind of thing. Most build packs won't care about writing to the bill of materials maybe, and so they don't have to. Uh, and so that's what we wanna do. We wanna give you an easy on-ramp to contribute functionality. And as you opt to make it more sophisticated, you sort of piecemeal pick the bits of the specification that you want to inside of your container and participate in them. Okay, cool. So, I mean, if there are more questions, especially about around Pakita build packs, and there, there is a, also a Slack community, which is very helpful there that I can definitely recommend. So um, please use that and, re and post your question in there. That will help other people um, which, pro which might have similar problems, of course, as well. Um, I always got very quick responses in there. So I can definitely recommend that and I appreciate it a lot. Okay, so that, uh, with that, I would slightly transition over to uh, our friends from SUSE um, um, to get started with the CubeCF part of today's meeting. Um, so Tulio Troy, are you ready? Cool, thanks. I guess Troy is going to share now. That looks good. Hi, okay, everyone. Ben, thank you so much. And I'll, I'll, uh, I, I'll add Ben's slides um, to the Meetup page so you can access them from there. And also, we have that, um, that stream be recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. I just have to uh, get this in a state where it doesn't automatically advance on me. I hate this. Um, Hi, uh, I'm Troy Topnik. Um, thank you so much, Matthias, for in inviting us. Uh, I am joined here by Tulio Assis. We're going to talk about KubeCF, which you may have heard something about uh, how to run Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes right now. So uh, here's us. Uh, I don't know if I'm sharing my, I think I'm sharing my, uh, my video as well. I, I don't look like that right now because I haven't had my hair cut in a while. I don't know what Tulio looks like these days. Um, I am a product manager with SUSE, um, and I was uh, also working for HPE and ActiveState before that. So I've been playing with Cloud Foundry for a while, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, you can see me on Twitter at, at TroyTop or TroyTop on GitHub. Tulio, would you like to introduce yourself? Of course. Um, so I'm software engineer at SUSE in the Cloud Application Platform team. Uh, I've been working with uh, Cloud Foundry since uh, SUSE Cloud Foundry in about one year and a half ago. Um, but I've been playing with containers since forever. I don't know when. It's been a while. Um, and I bootstrapped uh, KubeCF as uh, a v formerly known as V3 branch on the SUSE Cloud Foundry. And then later it became the Cloud Foundry Incubator Project KubeCF. Yeah. I think Troy is going to tell a little bit more about the we're KubeCF gonna, history. We're going <laughs> to kick off a little bit about uh, KubeCF history. Um, but uh, briefly, here's what we'll talk about. Uh, where the project came from, um, sort of some of its roots. It uh, doesn't come from all one place, but there are some roots that go back into history a little bit and explain why it is how it is. Uh, and then we're going to explain how it is, uh, especially Tulio is going to get into the details of what makes up KubeCF, how it works, how it uh, transforms Bosch releases into things that uh, run on Kubernetes. And then I'll give a, a brief look at uh, where the short-term roadmap is leading us and what the goal of the project is uh, as it relates to the rest of Cloud Foundry. 
So uh, where did this thing come from? Um, what is it, first of all? It's a distribution of Cloud Foundry application runtime. I don't know how much we use this acronym CFAR anymore, but uh, that is meant to be the, specifically the part of Cloud Foundry that we normally talk about, which is the thing that uh, you push applications to, as opposed to Cloud Foundry Bosch or Cloud Foundry uh, uh, Container Runtime. This is the Cloud Foundry we, we typically talk about it. So it's a distribution of the application runtime for Kubernetes. Um, it requires as a prerequisite, this thing called uh, CF operator from Project Quarks uh, to uh, manage the releases that come ultimately from CF deployment, which is the canonical source of truth for Cloud Foundry releases. So uh, this is a SUSE led project uh, in the Cloud Foundry incubator. And we use it uh, as the basis for our commercial distribution of Cloud Foundry, which is called SUSE Cloud Application Platform. But uh, as uh, all our uh, software is open source, um, you can see pretty much exactly what's in that uh, product by just looking at kubectl and some of the upstream projects. Now, the, the upstream projects the project that this is this presentation is titled uh, uh, after is kubectl. But I do want to stress that we're also talking about something called Quarks here, the Quarks operator, which works in conjunction with kubectl. And these did not come out of the blue. Um, those of you who follow CF Dev will note that the uh, proposal for incubation was very recent. It was only February in 2020 that we proposed this project for incubation. And then already in March, we had version 1.0. 1 1 We're already at version 2.2.2. We've had several releases um, uh, in that short time. And it's very reasonable to ask how we got that far, got all of that done in such a short period of time. And the, and the truth is, uh, it, it didn't just happen overnight and it, it didn't come out of the blue. KubeCF uh, used to go by a different name. In fact, it used to go by several different names. And if you'll allow me, uh, indulge me a little bit to go back in time, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about where that came from. And we'll go right back to the very beginnings of uh, Cloud Foundry into, uh, before I became uh, uh, aware of it, which is what it was in a VMware internal project. Uh, uh, dubbed uh, also known as B29 before it was released. I first saw it in the, uh, in the press release and the, or say the, the demonstration that Derek Collison gave in April, 2011, uh, when it was open sourced under the Apache 2 license and showed the basic uh, functionality we've come to uh, know and love. Uh, then it was a VCAP push, but now it's CF push. Same thing, basically a lot was different behind the scenes in that code base. Um, the next year, uh, Bosch was released as a way to manage uh, deployments of Cloud Foundry. And I'll get into how that related to when I uh, got uh, in touch with Cloud Foundry. Um, just briefly though, uh, 2013, AMC and VMware create Pivotal, it takes over stewardship of Cloud Foundry, which they've done a, a wonderful job, thank you. Um, and, Cloud, uh, and the Cloud Foundry Foundation was launched. I'm gonna go back in time again and talk about another branch on that path that you might be familiar with. A company that I used to work for, for called Active State created a pro product from that initial release of Cloud Foundry, but made it, uh, it was a proprietary fork. So it was not, uh, not open source. Uh, and it was, a, it was starting, it started to become a very different release. Um, there were a lot of things that we wanted to do to commercialize it, to make it efficient, to make it easy to install, to make it small. Um, and so we just went ahead and did that. And there were things like replacing uh, uh, the authorization component with something we called AOK. We did a lot of hacks to the cloud controller, uh, some extensions to the API. It had a different uh, a CLI client called Staccato, but it was API compatible with what was going upstream, uh, going on upstream in Cloud Foundry. It actually actually introduced Heroku build packs before build packs were a thing in, in upstream Cloud Foundry. And then we had a, a completely different uh, idea of how to deploy it in, in a cluster. We used a, a server side tool called Kato to manage the cluster rather than relying on uh, an external orchestrator, which was Bosch. And uh, as you, you know, this is diverging a fair bit from um, 
uh, from Upstream Cloud Foundry. And there was always a little bit of friction when we developed a feature that we would like, we wanted to get upstream. There had been so much divergence with upstream that it was difficult to actually coordinate that uh, with the component teams. Eventually, uh, Staccato was sold to HPE. And uh, I went there as well as a number of people uh, who are still on the SUSE uh, team. Um, what happened immediately was, uh, because this has coincided with the creation or shortly thereafter the creation of the foundation, uh, work on this proprietary branch halted. And we started again completely uh, on a distribution that could be a Cloud Foundry certified. And I'll talk a little bit about what Cloud Foundry certification means a little bit later after the demo, <coughs> which explains some of the decisions that we took. Um, so we started work immediately on containerizing Cloud Foundry. There was a project which is now largely forgotten, but I, I thought I'd bring it up called CF Furnace, which you can think of as the precursor to Irene. CF Furnace was the first time it was proven that yes, you could take um, uh, Cloud Foundry applications and run them directly on, on Kubernetes uh, instead of using Diego as the scheduler. Um, and then we did release a product in the end called uh, Helium Staccato 4 and that included uh, uh, the cl a Cloud Foundry release called Helium Cloud Foundry. That is the important part for our discussion today. This thing called Helium Cloud Foundry, which was a containerized release of Cloud Foundry that was meant to run again, on a proprietary control plane on top of Kubernetes. The original uh, design idea was that this control plane could span multiple uh, schedulers, uh, such as Docker Swarm and Apache Mesos and Kubernetes. But we started with Kubernetes, and HCF was designed to run on that. When uh, <laughs> our team moved to, uh, to SUSE, um, we decided to refactor HCF which became SCF, SUSE Cloud Foundry, to run directly on Kubernetes and eliminate the, uh, this uh, control plane, which was starting to seem quite irrelevant. By this point, Kubernetes uh, had become the de facto standard for container scheduling. And we saw that as, as uh, we saw the extra layer as superfluous. So we, we rebased it to, to work directly on Kubernetes. And then uh, after a really great uh, series of meetings at, Cloud Foundry Summit Basel in 2017, mostly with um, SAP and IBM, we started a small working group to discuss upstreaming this. Because now, of course, we're not on a proprietary fork anymore. We're consuming upstream Cloud Foundry components. And the, the delta is much smaller between what the upstream teams are working on and what we are packaging. So we floated a proposal to CFDev. Um, and uh, this proposal, in order to gain the acceptance uh, at the time of the community, really did have to work with Bosch. There was really no other consideration for uh, a Kubernetes native release uh, directly from the upstream team. So that was one of our constraints. I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Uh, working within those constraints, though, we uh, did uh, make a, a product release off of SUSE Cloud Foundry. Uh, that was our first release of SUSE Cloud Application Platform. And then as we started refactoring to take into account the proposal that we had, uh, uh, we had put forward and some of the work that we'd done around that, uh, as Tulio hinted at earlier, the V3 branch of SCF became KubeCF and that entered incubation. And then we had 1.0 shortly thereafter. And so that was, uh, that was where it came from. Just to provide context, uh, and maybe a little later I'll explain about uh, why it works the way it does because of that history and because of some of the constraints we had. Tulio, can I turn it over to you? Yes, please. Would you like to share yourself or would you want me to advance the slides? Uh, I would like to share, but I think you have to stop sharing first. Yep. Okay. All right. Hope you guys can see that. Looks good. Cool. Uh, so how does it work? I listed three components at play here. Um, and there are many underlying uh, technologies uh, uh, under them. 
that I will not mention, but I'm going to mention in a high level here, those three, which is a fissile uh, quarks operator, formerly known as CF operator, uh, which was created uh, uh, even before kubectf, quite a bit of time before kubectf, and then kubectf itself. So what is fissile? Well, fissile is this tool that uh, takes a gzipped tarball release, a Bosch release, and a stem cell, a stem cell in already a container, um, and then it compiles the release packages and generates the final image with the compiled packages. And this image is, um, um, is in a state that we can uh, render job templates and execute the binaries. Uh, advantages of this is to be able to pre-compile a bunch of stuff, all those uh, uh, Cloud Foundry uh, uh, jobs that we use and just render them at runtime. Uh, <clears throat> Quarks operator, uh, as Troy mentioned, kubectf doesn't exist without Quarks operator, this is a very, very, very important piece to make kubectf work. It uh, was called CF operator before, and it takes a Bosch manifest with them, some extra goods that we, uh, 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 so we allow things like uh, passing Kubernetes specific uh, parameters. And then it generates the passwords and certificates uh, and create them as Kubernetes secrets. It generates the stateful sets and services. And like Ben mentioned on his, uh, on his presentation, uh, we don't want to be creating and, and maintaining 500, 1,000 lines of, of uh, Kubernetes manifests manually. So, so Quark's operator generates uh, stateful sets and services for us based on the Bosch manifest that we give, that, that we give it. It also has a very important piece that that uh, reduces a lot of configuration that we have to do on kubectf, which is uh, generating DNS configuration based on Bosch DNS aliases. So you know, like um, something wants to talk to NATs and they can reach uh, 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 the internal uh, alias that is defined on the CF deployment manifest. So Quarks operator generates that for us as well. Um, and then it renders manifests at runtime. It does that by creating init containers for those stateful sets. Um, and one of the init containers is uh, render, rendering the templates, the job templates with uh, the secrets that it uh, uh, pulls from Kubernetes that it generates from password certificates. And then it manages the life cycle of stateful sets. And not just stateful sets, uh, but also services. Uh, for example, we add something new and it will create a new service. Or uh, if, we, if, we, if we, for example, uh, want to have more replicas of one of the uh, instance groups, for example, uh, Quarks operator is going to manage all that. And it also manages in a way that if uh, we change a property, it will recognize uh, Bosch links and it will restart dependence on whatever we changed. Cool, so Quark's operator uh, will also use the fissile images uh, on those uh, generated stateful sets. And then we go into kubectf. Kubectf is quite actually simple to explain and uh, Sometimes I say it is the CF deployment for Kubernetes, um, but in fact, it uses CF deployment as a base. And then what we do is we tweak CF deployment and we put extra configurations to make it Kubernetes friendly and um, uh, Quarks operator friendly to be able to run cloud, uh, the, the Cloud Foundry application runtime on top of Kubernetes. And it also makes it easy to enable and disable features. For example, if you want to disable CredHub, 
it's uh, easy to do because kubectl uh, is installed via Helm. Helm has a templating mechanism that we can just uh, apply op operation files to remove PredHub or enabling something like Autoscaler. Uh, Autoscaler is on kubectl and you can enable it by just setting uh, a, a feature flag to true. I'll, I'll show a little bit of that um, in a bit. And it also is useful to swap stuff. For example, we can swap Diego with Irene. So it does both disabling Diego and enabling Irene also with a single uh, uh, feature flag. We call them feature flags. Good. Um, so I know you guys all look like Dwight at this moment. Impatient, show me the demo. Okay, let me show you guys the demo then. Um, I'm going to show you uh, how, from a perspective of a Cloud Foundry application developer wanting to uh, develop and test the applications locally. So I have here, a Kubernetes cluster that I created using Kind. Uh, we can create a cluster um, like this. Um, it all takes a, a little bit of time, so I'm not going to exactly run all those commands. Um, I'm going to show what they look like. I can actually uh, Could you make it create a, a little a little bigger. Uh, as appears a little sure. Bit. Good, good. Good? Better. Yeah. Ah, I guess I have to do that on all of them. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, uh, I'm not going to run all those commands because they take a little bit of time. As you may know, Cloud Foundry is not a, a simple system, a small system. Um, so you create a kind cluster like this, you give it a name, and my case here, and I like to also give it a path to a kube config so I don't get um, all my Kubernetes uh, uh, contexts into a single kube config. So I already created this, and it looks like, like this one. It creates a, a, a cluster like this and say like, okay, you can connect to it, which looks like this nothing in it. So first thing that I have to do is to um, create the self operator namespace. I, I still I have this habit of uh, creating CF operator instead of quarks operator because uh, it has been renamed uh, recently so I didn't lose this habit yet. Uh, so we create the, 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 the self operator namespace and then we helm install CF operator. Um, I'm using Helm 3, so it's the syntax for Helm 3. It's the name of the release, the namespace. I want to deploy to the CF operator namespace that I just created. And then I'm going to use CF operator TGZ. I'm going to tell you um, in a second how you obtain this. And then I set the the operator uh, uh, watch namespace, it's uh, where the CF operator, the Quarks operator is going to watch for the manifests, the custom resource definitions that we give it. And I will explain a little bit uh, 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 CF operator in a second or how um, a Kubernetes operator uh, works. But first, how do you obtain kubectl and CF operator? You can go to the kubectl uh, Cloud Foundry Incubator project and under the releases, we have this bundle file. This bundle contains the dependency, which is a CF operator with a particular version. And uh, the kubectl chart itself, the version that we released here, uh, we pin to a specific CF operator version because that's uh, how we test kubectl uh, many, many times a day. And we ensure that with this CF operator, uh, it will work well. So after we install CF operator, 
it will create those two pods here. They are actually, they come from uh, uh, Kubernetes deployments. And if you, some of you may not be that familiar well, uh, with Kubernetes. Kubernetes, think as a, the, this state machine that we want to provide to it the state that we want it to be, and it will work to get there. And it does this by uh, uh, leveraging what we call controllers. And those controllers watch for Kubernetes resources like pods or deployments or stateful sets, uh, daemon sets, in order to, to be, okay, this is a manifest that you say to me, you want to happen. And then I'm going to create containers to be able to get their networks uh, for those uh, containers. And Kubernetes also allows us to create custom resource definitions, which is um, I tell uh, Kubernetes what exactly uh, my API is, so people can uh, users can uh, uh, provide resources in a way that Kubernetes doesn't understand natively, but then it defers to a controller, and those sets of controllers we call operators and hence CF operator and now Quark's operator. So it runs in cluster uh, watching things from Kubernetes and Kubernetes uh, 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 forwards that to us and then it creates uh, 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 all the resources that we defined which are going to be those, which is the kubectl uh, part. So any questions so far? Sorry, I have to unmute first. Um, I, I have not seen any questions in the QA or the chat. And as I checked, you, no, we're, you, we're good at the moment. Okay. okay. Thanks for checking. I don't know if that means that I'm talking things that nobody understood or if I explained too well that everybody <laughs> understood everything. <laughs> Anyways, I, I will continue and just interrupt me if anybody posts a question. I will, sure thing. Thanks for checking back. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthias. All right, so we got an operator running. It is waiting for Bosch manifest. In our case, it's going to be kubectl manifest. Um, so here I extracted self operator, as I mentioned, and also the kubectl release TGZ. Um, kubectl expects some stuff to know how it will run. It doesn't just expect self deployment. And, we can pass those uh, 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 configurations uh, using values.raml that I have here. Let me show you how it looks like in my case. So uh, I want to pass to it uh, a CF admin password. I don't want it to get generated. So it's more predictable and we can do this. This is something new within kubectl, the credentials um, top level, uh, proper, uh, property. Uh, and we can actually, with credentials, we can overwrite passwords and certificates, which is useful for production usage as well to be, to be leveraged. In my case, local development, I just want a predictable password. Um, here, it's essential to run uh, locally and especially with kind. I say, um, those services are created by kubectl. They are not created by CF operator. Uh, CF operator cares about uh, creating services for internal communication within the cluster, uh, not exposing anything. To expose something, we have to create services manually. In our case, we create them for a router, SSH proxy, and TCP router on kubectl. I'm skipping TCP router because I also disable routing API. I'll get there in a moment. Um, but then I have to tell it, uh, kubectl, what is the external IP that it should use so we can reach the cluster from outside. Uh, this IP I got from the node control plane so from the node control plane, the kind control plane, 
it has these status addresses and the internal IP, which is this one, which is an IP accessible from the host network. Uh, so later I can do uh, a CF API and point to this. There is an easier command to do this, which is this. Um, uh, I can put on the slides and publish later so you don't have to screenshot now. Feel free to do so if you want, but I can I can pass, which will give me that exactly uh, that exact uh, IP address. So let's get back to here. Since the uh, the router and SSH proxy they listen on different parts, it's fine to use the same IP for those services. So the router is on port four four three and port eighty, and maybe another port that I don't remember now and SSH proxy on port 2222. Uh, then we have to pass the system domain. Uh, and I just use an IP.io uh, and I use the, the IP in front of it. I, I, I assume you guys are familiar with this. There are XIP as well and maybe others uh, that I don't know. Feel free to use whatever. Um, and then features, those are the feature flags that I told previously uh, that we can enable, disable, or swap things. Here I'm not swapping, I, I'm sticking to Diego, uh, but I am disabling explicitly Autoscaler, I am disabling explicitly CredHub and Routing API. Why? Because I want a minimal kubectl system running locally, um, as minimal as possible, but is still um, uh, close to a full featured uh, 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 Cloud Foundry application runtime. Uh, I think this is it for the configuration. And then uh, we install uh, kubectl by saying, I want it to be installed on kubectl namespace, which if you guys uh, uh, remember actually, let me do this here. I have so, a quick question right now. Sure, um, sure. Actually, I, I've just tried this uh, over the weekend, and um, I tried to figure out what, what would be like the, the most minimal kind of config that you could come up with, because I, I wouldn't, wasn't able to get it running on, on a kind on a Mac with 16 gig of memory, but I was able to get it running on a 32 gig machine. Um, so is there a description available somewhere on which of, how to set the flags and which would be working versions and what are the like the things that you would actually have to put in there uh, anyway yeah so you can do you can inspect the values of uh, the chart like this and then um okay and then you can see here those are uh, things that they all have a default value. So Irene is disabled by default, mm -hmm. but then you also have Ingress, uh, SUSE default stack. Some of those play together with other stuff, uh, uh, but for uh, an experimentation, you can like, for for example, disable also SUSE build packs, disable CredHub, disable routing API, uh, embedded database, I, I guess you, you would want for local development. Uh, Matthias, we, we do have this as an action item to, to document a minimal config that people can use so that it will fit in the smallest case possible so people can try it out. We, I mean, that's yes. great. I'd be into the happy box. to volunteer testing that because I- Great. <laughs> uh, and we also want to investigate what else we can shrink, right? Because this is not, we, we, we don't have a, a feature flag for everything. Mm -hmm. on, on kubectl to be disabled. Maybe we can disable more things, more jobs perhaps um, that we can shrink to make it smaller, faster to deploy even locally for quick demos or a quick experimentation, right? Exactly right, that's what I was looking for. Cool. Okay, cool, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, cool, so this was the, the, the the one that we used to deploy, the command that we used to deploy CF operator. And you remember we passed the, 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 the namespace to watch. So we have to install kubectl on the namespace that we provided. 
And we don't need to create the namespace because CF operator created that for us. Thank you, CF operator. Um, and then when we deploy, and this is the command that actually takes a, a quite a bit of time because it has to download a bunch of images and, and wait sequentially, as we have not yet optimized the initialization time, uh, we are very much aware that we can do uh, lots of initial, initialization in, uh, concurrently. Uh, but the way we have the manifest so far we inherit from CF deployment, we do kind of a sequential waiting for the previous uh, instance group to be ready to, to keep going. This is uh, uh, also to ensure that we don't break anything that uh, didn't initially expect to in, be initialized concurrently, right? So. Uh, up to this point, those jobs they expected to be used, most of them, with CF deployment that then uh, waits sequ sequentially. Anyways, that's um, a long story that I could talk about for a long time. We've been investigating that. It will get better. Uh, and after we deploy this, it will, like I described, uh, CF operator will take over. Let me increase this. Okay, Ceph operator uh, will take over and we'll generate all the secrets and then it will start all those uh, 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 stateful sets. Those are pods that come from stateful sets. Uh, and then eventually they will, like I described, uh, uh, Kubernetes is, is a state machine. They will eventually get into the ready state that we can then using this, Skip validation because we didn't provide um, we didn't provide a uh, a certificate that we uh, trust on the computer. Uh, I guess uh, you guys can always create certificates locally with your local CA uh, uh, root and that you already trust and pass it to kubecf. But for local testing and development, that's usually unnecessary. Logging can create all that. And note that I'm, I'm executing from the host, right? Um, and then I can even classic, same way as before as um, the Bosch deployment, uh, 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 the, the, the Bosch uh, CF deployment, we can do the same, same experience, same CF push with kubectf as well, locally. Okay, so I think that ends my part and this is local and Troy is going to show us a grown up cluster. What does it look like for a production environment? Thank you. Okay, hey, uh, like, like Tilio did, here's, here's one I prepared earlier. This one is a kubectf uh, deployment that is going on to Amazon EKS. Uh, I've uh, used a bit of Terraform to deploy a few spot instances. This is a demo cluster. I'm not uh, too worried about it uh, going away, but I use spot instances. This one's nearer to you guys in uh, EU Central 1. And on it, I've deployed a uh, fully functional uh, kubectf based platform as a service, uh, actually using, using the SUSE bits here. So I'm cheating a little bit and using uh, the SUSE Stratos console, which has uh, Kubernetes uh, endpoint functionality. You can attach it to multiple Cloud Foundry endpoints. I just have to clear something here on my screen. Uh, we can attach it to multiple Cloud Foundry endpoints, multiple en metrics endpoints, multiple Helm, um, endpoints um, and, and uh, so I have connected it to my Amazon EKS endpoint which is here three nodes those are the ones we saw earlier we can dig into those and see what 
pods and uh, what pods are running on those and what, uh, what the metrics are for those. And we can get uh, <coughs> right into the workloads. And we can see the CF operator running here. And basically, uh, we can see the uh, Helm values that it was uh, deployed with, which was just, as Tulio noted, uh, watch namespace. And this is the same information that you would get from the CLI with a uh, tool like kubectl or kind. <clears throat> you can see um, I'm running in what we call single availability mode um, in a high availability cluster with maybe a little bit larger resources. I could probably do it in, in the nodes that I have but it would um, uh, replicate uh, roles that can be replicated so that we've got better uh, failover behavior. But this is, um, this is running uh, all the things as, as well as a broker uh, that we ship uh, and uh, Stratos in the metrics chart. Uh, maybe I should show the uh, my values YAML so we can see that. So here, and uh, you can see I have similar values to what uh, what Tulio had, but I'm using a real certificate. I made this one uh, for my domain, which I pointed to the load balancer that this is being served from. And uh, my Let's Encrypt cert gives me proper SSL connections so I can uh, launch applications. I'll quickly do one here. From GitHub. Deploy it to the CISA org and the dev space. Uh, I haven't moved these over yet. A little goofy application that we can uh, deploy. Pick the commit that we want. Give it a name. Call it game. Just take the defaults from the manifest file. It'll do a shallow clone and then, then deploy. This is just doing exactly what you would see from the command line, but it's using the Stratos interface, which is also a, a Cloud Foundry project. So all of this is also available from the upstream, um, from the upstream Stratos. Okay, now I do have Autoscaler enabled, but I haven't created any policies here. This, uh, this would work the same way with any uh, CF. So if I deployed it using Bosch and connected, uh, I would get the same behavior. Likewise, if I connected to different versions of Cloud Foundry, it should uh, uh, always deploy those things, or it should always show um, the system that I'm connected to. I just want to get back to the slides here and we'll uh, talk about where kubectl is going from here. Okay, so we talked about where kubectl comes from, uh, how it works right now. Thank you, Tulio, for explaining that to us. Um, you may have noticed that there is more going on related to Kubernetes in the Cloud Foundry community right now. We should uh, talk about that and talk about where um, where kubectl is now and where it's going to go in the uh, in the near term. But first, I want to make clear some of the constraints that, uh, that explain why kubectl is built the way it is. So when we started on this project, Cloud Foundry certification uh, required uh, distributing certain core uh, Cloud Foundry application runtime components. That's still the case. Um, and the official way to get those was from CF deployment, from the Bosch releases. So therefore, in order to make a distribution that could be certified, we had to work with those Bosch releases. Those Bosch releases require orchestration that Kubernetes cannot do on its own. We, uh, the earlier versions of SCF uh, tried to automate as much of that and try to, um, to handle them as much of that when we built it. When, when the SUSE team would build uh, SCF, we had to include a lot of the logic. Um, uh, that uh, operations has now been taken over by uh, the CF operator, Quark's operator. Um, our customers required uh, an upgrade path for future versions. We couldn't just say, that's it. Uh, 
you can't have uh, the old Cloud Foundry anymore. We're going to give you a new Cloud Foundry at some point in the future. They wanted to run uh, on Kubernetes right now. And so we responded to that. Uh, after talking to a lot of Kubernetes administrators, we are a number of us Kubernetes administrators at some degree uh, or other ourselves. Um, we wanted to work with tools that we knew. Uh, and those tools are things like kubectl and Helm. But Helm is not as far reaching as Bosch Director. It cannot handle the sort of things that uh, uh, a Bosch deployment does. Hence the, uh, the move to <coughs> use a CF operator or a Quarks operator with CRDs that could handle a lot of those things that the Bosch release was required. So that is why it's sort of built the way it is. And now we've shown that we can do this. We've taken CF deployments, we track the upstream deployments, and we package them as a Helm chart. And in conjunction with this, the uh, Quarks operator, we can deploy them to Kubernetes. Um, that's, that's where we are right now, but things are getting more complicated. Uh, upstream has now broadly accepted that Kubernetes is the place to run Cloud Foundry, which means we have sort of a traditional Cloud Foundry deployment mechanism, which is Bosch releases, and now an entirely new set of uh, components coming from upstream or modifications of those components, which do not have those same res restraints. Some of them are packaged just, as, just uh, as an image with some Kubernetes config. Some of them are packaged as, uh, as Helm charts. Some are still Bosch releases. And some of the things we have yet to determine how uh, best to package them. So how are we going to turn that <coughs> into a nice installation experience for, for users and in our case for customers. <coughs> so here's where I want to draw you uh, your attention to the project that is the integration project for all of these new upstream uh, components. And right from the, the GitHub readme, it says this is highly experimental project to deploy the new Q, uh, Kubernetes centric components on Kubernetes, not meant for use in production and is subject to change in the future. That was, that's just to let you know the state of it right now, but I would say that it's, it is uh, advancing quite quickly. Now that the whole Cloud Foundry community is sort of on board with the, the transformation to Kubernetes project, we're seeing a lot of movement here. Now that team and uh, a lot of the upstream um, component teams have adopted a tool chain which is sort of created for this purpose, um, uh, K14S uh, IO uh, tool chain. Uh, very good in its design, uh, uh, uses particularly YTT for templating and CAP for deployment. Um, this is not something that kubectl uses because we wanted to use something that was already in widespread use in the Kubernetes community. Um, so there's a difference there. Um, CF4K8 only uses the next generation CFAR components. I've seen some great demos that use Irene with KPAC and Paketo build packs to, um, to, to deploy things. And they're, they're working very well. Note that this is a, a distribution, <coughs> a, a nascent distribution, with very few constraints on it that, that kubectl has. kubectl uh, was born from Bosch releases. This one was set out with the mindset to force the upstream teams to adopt a Kubernetes native mindset. So we use all the Kubernetes features that we can. It's looking really good. I saw a demo the other day. Uh, install time is nice and fast. Staging is great with the cloud native build packs. And um, sourcing Kubernetes native components when you're making a Kubernetes distribution of software is a lot, uh, a lot easier than uh, some of the stuff that, that um, that uh, Tulio was talking about uh, using the Bosch serialization in a Kubernetes context. So um, there's going to be a lot of great uh, advantages that we'll be able to take care of, uh, take advantage of. And that's what I wanted to leave you with. Uh, because some people come to both projects and they get confused about how they relate to each other. Uh, kubectl and uh, Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes projects are not opposed. They take different approaches at the moment, but they are converging and they will ultimately converge. They may always have different deployment mechanisms, but the code that they are both containing will eventually uh, be consistent and be the same. Uh, kubectl uh, provides that Cloud Foundry application runtime experience right now. Uh, we've got it passing all of its acceptance tests. It's the basis of our commercial distribution and soon to be the commercial distribution by others. Um, uh, it, it already has a couple of uh, certified commercial releases. 
CF for K8s is a proving ground. And it's uh, making the component teams come up with what we call now Kubernetes idiomatic releases, things that use the Kubernetes uh, API to its, its fullest capability. Uh, and so over time, these things, uh, these components uh, that are uh, emerging, that are evolving, will be incorporated one by one into kubectl as they become available. Next up, I believe for us is UAA. Uh, then shortly we'll probably follow uh, other things uh, uh, as as they become available upstream. Some resources here. Uh, there are doc sites in the state of flux for kubectl kubectf.cisa.dev. You can also find them at the re in the repo. And of course, there's a kubectf dev channel and all of that same stuff for quarks. A quark documentation site, uh, the repo, of course, in the incubator and, uh, and uh, the Slack channel. And with that, I wanted to thank you very much. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, thanks Tulio for, for walking us through that. Thank and thank you, you Matthias, for, um, for, uh, for inviting us to this. Well, it was a pleasure to do that. Thank you, Matthias. Thanks, Troy, for um, doing all that. The pleasure is definitely on my side. I mean, th those were two really, really good talks today. And um, also great to see how people used um, both the Zoom and the, the YouTube channel. I think at the peak time, we had about um, 60 people um, this is a good turnout, given the fact that we did not provide any free pizza, pizza and beer today. <laughs> this is like how I normally attract all the people. I wasn't able to do that. Um, and um, I, I also thanks for that final part, uh, Troy, that you just mentioned, like CF4Ks and KubeCF, because that was one of the questions I had on my mind. And I'm definitely looking to have somebody um, speaking about CF4Ks fairly soon as well, because I found that project pretty interesting too. And, and, and good to hear it uh, from your perspective um, that it's not like a competition, but something which will both be used to bring Cloud Foundry forward in combination with Kubernetes, which has been a, a topic for quite a long time. And just good to see that it's getting better and better. Yeah, and I, it, it, it was almost inevitable because um, I, I remember this was a conversation at CF Summit in Boston <clears throat> where we talked about the future of Cloud Foundry on Kubernetes and everyone was unanimous that that is where Cloud Foundry had to go. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was really no ambiguity there at that point. But there was this uh, philosophy, which I'm now coming to accept a little bit more, that when you start from scratch and you deal uh, with Kubernetes native components, uh, and you have to rethink, you have to rethink how it's built, you can actually take advantage of things in Kubernetes that if you're working as a, from a gradual migration from Bosch, which is what we've been doing, uh, mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily come up with. So yes, and we've, we've been uh, in very close contact with the, the Relent team uh, under Sai uh, uh, from, from VMware. And uh, the collaboration between the kubectl teams and the CF4Ks teams is, is really coming along. And uh, I, I'm really very optimistic that we're, uh, we're working in the same direction and uh, are going to have a really kick-ass cloud foundry at the end of this. <laughs> Love to hear that. <laughs> All right, so I think there was one more question um, from Jonathan again. Is this taking us from a vanilla Kubernetes? Is that the full question or is there something missing? Um, it's over at the um, YouTube chat. I'm not sure exactly. Could you just quickly read it again? Uh, it was just like, is this taking us from a vanilla Kubernetes question mark? Yes. So that's, that's the, the goal, is that uh, we go from any distribution of uh, Kubernetes, 14, uh, 114 or later, currently, um, uh, that satisfies a few minimum requirements, uh, can, uh, can run kubectl, if that was the question. It does, I mean, CF operator, or I should say Quark's operator, does make add some CRDs uh, in order to run kubectl, but it is in all other ways a complete, it could be uh, Kubernetes from anyone. Mm. I mean, we support it on SUSE CAS platform, on EKS, AKS, and GKE, uh, but people are running it in all sorts of things. And as, as Tulio showed, we're doing development on Kind. You can use it on Minikube as well. Um, yeah. uh, it's yeah. a... It's any yeah. kind of Kubernetes. Yeah, a few public platforms, they may have uh, some, uh, sorry, Matthias, I interrupted you. 
No, go go ahead. I, I'm okay. Uh, yeah, so so a few uh, public cloud platforms may have different tweaks to make it work. So, for example, yesterday I was working with Enrique from IBM on on the IBM cloud, and we had to we had to use for Diego uh, ephemeral um, uh, volumes. We had to use a specific uh, storage class uh, with the dash GID at the end, which allows writing access from known root to users. So, you know, the, it works on, on various Kubernetes platforms, but yes, there may be tweaks on specific uh, distributions. That was my experience as well. I mean, I've tried it um, both on, uh, like kubectl and CF4K on, on Azure clusters like AKS. The, got, uh, I had to do something with the, the public IP there, but got it working in the end. I, I hope to pull up a, a blog post uh, fairly soon about that, and also I, on a Docker for desktop environment, it worked pretty good too. So um, yeah, I mean that's, oh, that's good to know because that that's something that I've never tried before. No, good that worked. That, that worked well. I didn't I didn't have to use kind, so just Docker for desktop and enable the Kubernetes, and uh, as like um, containerized in a containerized version, um, which which did the thing. And so this is also the, the, the good side of the story. I think there's so many available Kubernetes options and it's very really easy just like to, to plug your cloud foundry in there and then um, get going. I think the um, Steve Greenberg has built the, the offering for Katakoda, which I showed in the beginning of the, of the meetup, which is also built on, on, on KubeCF, I think using Google Cloud. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, good. I mean, uh, if there are no more questions, because those were intense talks. <laughs> and, uh, I saw that there was a question and answer in, in open asking about Bosch and when it's going to go away or something like that. I was, I didn't, I missed that. Thanks for helping me. <laughs> it, uh, oh, yeah. Actually, I cannot see that anymore. No, it's still, when do you think will Bosch is not used okay. anymore and what will replace it? Okay, so there are, Bosch does more than one thing, <laughs> right? It does a, a few things. <laughs> uh, so some of functionality of Bosch is being used right now by Quark's operator, for example, for rendering jobs. We use uh, uh, the uh, Bosch for doing that. We do not use Bosch anymore for managing VMs because those VMs are managed by Kubernetes right now, right? Uh, so I think Bosch m may go away. Uh, it's, it's hard to predict or say something right now, but uh, it, it is going to go away when people stop using it to build their releases, the releases that we depend on <laughs> to make the cloud, uh, the, the cloud Foundry application runtime, right? It yeah. depends on the many hundred contributors that we have on Cloud Foundry. It's not up to us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. When you Up stop you using guys. Bosch, then, uh, then we can stop using Bosch. Okay. Um, so if there's nothing more, I would slowly sh shut it down. Um, I mean, we're going to publish this recording on this um, YouTube channel where it was recorded. Um, if, Troy or Tuli, if, if you could send me also the slides from your talk, I will Good edit to the meetup Good. page. Um, and I mean, yeah, that was a really great experience with, uh, for that first virtual meetup. I definitely want to do that again. Um, it also brings the possibility to get speakers that I always wanted to have to Stuttgart virtually. <laughs> thanks for being the, 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 uh, the first ones to do that. And, um, yeah, thanks a lot from my side. I, I learned a lot today. Definitely. Great. Always like to hear that. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Bye -bye, everyone.